So I spent a long time thinking about what I wanted to ask Charles. I have this philosopher in front of me and I get to ask him whatever I want. He doesn't call himself a philosopher, but he is. <laughs> and I couldn't get away from this topic of metaphysics and how it affects me in my personal life. And I had some cacao a little bit ago and I realized like the deep down reason for why. I can't get away from that. Like it's hard for me to even pay attention to the more earthly questions sometimes without these being answered at least a little bit. And I felt like it was my, this like six year old in me, this like inner child who was asking these questions all the time of my dad a lot of the times or anybody who would listen. Um, why am I here? Um, why is mom sick? Um, you know, what do you, what do you mean the universe is this big and what hap what exists beyond the universe and how does the universe end? Or if it does end, what's beyond it? Or if it's nothingness, how is that a thing? And he was very patient. <laughs> he would sit with me and answer these questions, which I'm very grateful for, but ultimately, you know, he didn't have answers to most of these things, of course. And, and a lot of the answers he did have was, you know, this is what physics knows at this point. Um, you know, we, we came from the Big Bang and everything is just randomness running into each other. And the universe is expanding and eventually it'll expand so far that it's cold and everything dies and then it'll contract and explode again and there may not be anything beyond it and all this and most of the time people wouldn't entertain these questions and it was like stop overanalyzing things you're super weird <laughs> but there's like this very deep place in my heart that wants to know why I'm here. <laughs> I spent like the first 22 years of my life in science, mainly because I wanted to explore the universe on like the most fundamental level possible. Um, so I studied chemistry and biochemistry and the answers are bleak. The answers are what my dad would tell me about, you know, everything is just increasing entropy until there's nothing. And I think I, I learned to like suppress these questions and to sort of just try to enjoy my experience of life or to try to create my own meaning. Like, well, I'm here anyway, I may as well make the best of it. But there's like the most core place in me like wants to be connected to something that matters, to something bigger. And I'm like, I'm never gonna stop asking these questions. Um, and there may not be answers, but I at least wanna know like what, what can be known about why I'm here or why my life matters or um, what the point is. When things get really, really, really quiet and I'm not in a place of distracting myself with, you know, the feeling of meaning through my work or my relationships. Um, when I get really, really quiet and honest, there's like a spiritual sickness in there that's like okay but i'm not satisfied with any of the answers that i've gotten um there's like a disconnection there there's like a very vulnerable little six-year-old in there that still has no idea 
Um, you know, there are philosophies that feel better than others, but there's like a huge uncertainty. And most people don't really want to go there uh, or they're just not interested in it. So I have an opportunity here to talk to somebody who's been thinking about this a lot longer than me. Um, I don't expect him to have the answers. It's not the all-knowing guru or anything. But he is a delightful nerd. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is for six-year-old, six-year-old Lauren. No more that I want to say. So, Charles, you may have noticed I'm often asking you questions about metaphysics, and I've noticed you don't always love to answer them. <laughs> so I've been asking myself a lot, like, why do I really want to know this, and why can I not let it go? It's like I crave it deep down, and it's because I don't know why I'm here and I don't know what the point is. And I'm afraid there isn't a point. And I'm afraid of deluding myself into thinking there's a point when there really isn't, or it's actually a different point. Like, I, I'm afraid of missing out on the point. I want to be part of a meaningful life, meaningful relationships, a meaningful species, a meaningful planet, a meaningful universe. And I want to know, like, what is actually happening? <laughs> it's easy to see nihilism or existentialism as making a lot of sense, but they do not feel very good. And it's easy for me to see why religion would be comforting, but for me, it seems contrived. I'm scared to say that. <laughs> Uh, controversial, but it doesn't feel right to me and I can't bl bring myself to believe it. So here I am in a space between stories. I exited mainstream science, the what I see as the religion now that I was indoctrinated into for the first 22 years of my life. And I still love science, but I also now see its limitations and see the dogma in it. And I've been exploring these agnostic and secular spiritual communities. And I feel surrounded by misinformation, disinformation, people with agendas, people with the answer, people with certainty who think they have it all figured out, people who overrepresent their knowledge and understanding of this stuff. And people projecting certainty for whatever reason, maybe their own deep down existential fear, or, you know, maybe for profit, I don't know. And although the process of learning and seeking new ideas and new experiences is a total flow state for me, it's also disillusioning to look for so long and find so little. And it turns out it takes a pretty special brain to have the patience and talent to even make a half decent attempt at wrapping your head around this topic of metaphysics. So this is me thinking, Charles has been thinking about metaphysics, the meaning of life, how to live a meaningful life for decades longer than me and in a totally different way, a way that I don't use my brain to go Myers-Briggs for a second in an INTJ way. And he's smart and not guru-y he doesn't think he has the answers or think he's the chosen one. And that is why I want his thoughts on these things. Even though it might feel totally out of his depth, and even if he feels afraid that he might be like dipping his toes into guru territory. It's like, there are 7.5 billion people on this planet that are flailing about in all kinds of ways because they don't know why they're here and they don't know if anything matters and they don't know if they matter. It feels like this is such a core sickness that most people share. And maybe not everyone will want this huge abstract topic addressed directly, 
but enough people will. This subject, metaphysics, is at the tippy top of everything. And not that many people can reach the tippy top or even try or even find it interesting. And here we have Charles, who's probably been thinking about this his entire life, I would guess. And yes, many of these questions, maybe all of them are ultimately unanswerable, but there's some wisdom and knowledge in there. And even just like a lay of the land would be incredible. Um, to me, this is like the most transcendent level of like a radicalization of love. And to use Myers-Briggs language again, I can tell you like the less than 10% of people that lead with an intuitive cognitive function are going to want to go to this information first. So badly that they will never stop asking you about it. And almost nobody serves that population well. So I don't expect you to have the answer to what's the point? Why am I here? What's actually happening? I mean, these are ancient questions, but it would be really great to have somebody who's been thinking about this a long time, who's thinking I respect and constantly align with in some deep and eerie way, who's on a similar quest to drop some wisdom. And knowing all that, my main question is, what would you say to somebody like me? Because I think there's a lot of people in this situation. If not, I am. <laughs> cool. <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, yeah, we should use the whole thing. <laughs> Good job, Uncut verbatim. How long? How long? <laughs> I have no idea. Isn't that funny? How long was it? Twelve minutes. <clears throat> yeah, that was great. <clears throat> yeah, I really appreciate this inquiry and the invitation to speak on these things. The first thing that comes to mind, though, is uh, maybe my favorite saying from the Tao Te Ching. Um, I like to say it in Chinese just because it has such a beautiful poetics. Uh, literally means, and you've heard it before, um, those who know do not say, and those who say do not know. And it's not because those who know are holding back on saying. It's that translated into words, it becomes something other than the truth. Because this inquiry is highly personal. It's not to say that there isn't an answer that might, might come to you in, in, through your inquiry and through your processes of life. But that answer, translated into words, may not be the answer for another person. And the answer has to grow from within rather than being um, placed from without. And that doesn't mean that, that coming across spiritual teachings, metaphysical teachings, that that's not useful. But those have to be met with an inner development. And the particular words or teachings that meet the inner development are, are personal. So somebody who is in the role of a spiritual teacher or a guru or something like that, which as Lauren said, isn't me, uh, but someone who is in that role will know when and how to meet the germinating inquiry and processes of another person with the right words for that person. And so really what I, what I would start by saying is that this is the right question and the value of the question, why am I here, doesn't depend on it achieving an answer. 
but it drives a life process. And one thing I really appreciate about about some of the things that Lauren was saying is that, is that um, she's not satisfied with a false answer and is staying with the question. And that's really all that's required is to stay with the question. And I would also say that it's a dangerous question in a certain sense because it opens the floodgates to a lot of, uh, a lot of, you could say, different energies, um, different inheritances that we have from our culture. Uh, the floodgates, uh, it opens up the floodgates to, to despair, to the esoteric teachings of the religion that Lauren referred to, the religion of science. You could look at, and, and, and it goes to a very, very dark place. You could look at science as a mystery school where there are different levels of initiation. There's kind of the popular version. And then there's the levels that are only available to high initiates, those who have studied mathematics, for example, those who have studied physics. And, and they're able to get more than just the um, popularized version. They're able to really understand what is meant by a universe composed of atoms and void, a universe composed of of pure information or um, a universe devolving toward entropy and to grasp the horrifying enormity of that concept. So that's what can come in through this inquiry. And I think a lot of people instinctively don't want to really go there and, and just to live lives that are oblivious to the uh, horrifying esoteric teachings of our, uh, our religion, the religion of science. So I'll just say that, that that religion is today crumbling on its, um, on its own merits, that even from a purely rational, logical place, it has inconsistencies and limitations and incongruence with observed reality. It can be maintained by ignoring those inconsistencies and incongruities. And if we're doing that, if we're maintaining it in that way, with this secret voice saying, you know it's true, but really what is true is not that we know that it's true. What's true is that we're afraid that it's true. And so to recognize that what is masquerading as reason is actually fear. It's fear masquerading as reason, that we're afraid that it's true. But it's um, on, an on like an observational level and on a logical level, there's really no good reason to accept the truth of this particular religion, the, the, the teachings of this particular mystery school over some other ones. But these teachings are in alignment with the whole culture. So you'll notice I have not given any answers to what is the point of life. Um, why am I here? But maybe I'll say that um, the reason for life is life. The reason for life is to make more life. The reason for life is to bring more life into all that is, to make the universe more and more and more alive. That life is unfolding into greater and greater livingness. And that uh, the point is to be a and this is just one way to look at things, but it can expand to an awful lot. The point is to be part of the livingness and, and the increasing livingness of life. And this goes opposite, to sort of go into a scientific frame, this is the opposite of the teaching of entropy, which says the universe is essentially winding down toward heat death, where, the, where everything is just one uniform uh, 
black body um, at whatever, four degrees Kelvin or something like that spread over the entire universe. That's, that's the end of things. And maybe there'll be a big crunch after, the, after this is all said and done. But, you know, depending on which theory you subscribe to or which, which interpretation of data you subscribe to, um, maybe it'll just keep expanding forever until it's this diffuse, amorphous, <clears throat> uniform mass of, of particles. So <clears throat> that's, that's what that, um, the story of science, the religion of science has taught us. Uh, the universe is winding down. But what we've been learning for the last 50 years through complexity theory, through cybernetics, through nonlinear dynamics, is that systems that are um, uh, through which energy is moving, um, where there's a, a flux of energy, tend toward greater and greater and greater complexity. So if you look at the universe as a flux of energy, then you see that, that this complexity and life is a stage. It's the name that we give to a certain stage of this complexity. It's, it's increasing along an arrow of time. It's the opposite of what the mystery school has told us. In other words, the, the nature of reality is, to, is toward life to become more and more alive, to become more and more complex. And we can see this in the history of the Earth. Like conventional, like neo-Darwinian biology essentially thinks that life is an accident. There was by chance a replicating molecule that began to, began to reproduce itself and then it mutated and more efficient reproducing versions developed and then some of them uh, built protein coats around themselves and lipid membranes about, around themselves and it's all but and got more and more complicated better and better at reproducing themselves but that's the fundamental driver of everything a chemical accident and what we're seeing or I guess this is maybe a suggestion that I take from um, complexity theory is that this is a universal process that happens in any sufficiently complex system with nonlinear feedbacks. That, light, that, the, that, that the universe and reality is pregnant with life, life always wanting to burst forth and, and can only be suppressed with great effort actually. So, so I'm, I'm seeing then this, this incomprehensible, incomprehensibly vast um, exfoliation of order from the unicellular level to the multicellular to the level of, of, of humans and, and ecosystems and societies and civilizations and and you know these are just maybe a few of the early steps toward the universe coming alive. We don't actually understand how alive the universe is. The dominant cosmological models today are all based on gravitation, which is pretty darn linear. I mean, you can calculate things very, very precisely by integrating all of the uh, different gravitational um, components, whereas the um, minority view of cosmology, which is based on electromagnetism and plasma physics, is highly nonlinear. And if you look at a map of the universe through the lens of plasma, you get all of these structures. If you look at the sun through the, through the electromagnetic lens, uh, you see all these incredibly complicated structures, or I would actually say complex structures. And the whole thing looks alive. Like you have the feeling that you're looking at this living thing. That only becomes available, that view only becomes available when you look for it. So 
the alienated self in a universe of atoms and void that grinds along mechanically toward heat death. That is a myth. It's a story. It is one way of looking at things. And that way of looking at things corresponds to a state of being. That is an evolutionary stage in human development. It is an expression of the course of separation, as I call it. It is the quintessence of separation. So separate, <clears throat> excuse me, so separate we are that, that, that we deny the livingness of the universe itself and our part in it. Um, and I think that in order to move past this particular level of development, it needs to be inhabited in all of its fullness. And that's where the last few generations have gone. It's, it's to the full grokking of this metaphysical teaching, this, which goes along with a state of being, uh, a, a profound existential alienation from the universe, where you are nothing but a uh, biochemical accident, uh, um, a, a fuzz of biochemistry whirling along uh, and living out your life until you're snuffed out at the end and that's it. And I'm not going to disprove that. It is a full-on state of being. And there really is no disproof possible because no matter what evidence you're offered, even if you've you know, had communications from deceased relatives or you've had experiences that just do not fit into that um, worldview, you can still dismiss them. You can, they don't, they don't meet that state of being on its own terms necessarily. They only meet the intellectual layer of that state of being. What meets it on its own terms are experiences like, um, you know, having a near-death experience maybe, or uh, a religious, spiritual, mystical experience, or a psychedelic experience. Um, and they, they just invalidate the entire, like you've moved on. And once you've moved on, on on that deeper level, then alternative cosmologies become very attractive and common sense. So yeah, and, and maybe that's why in well, why the sage that Lao Tzu speaks of does not say even though he knows, because maybe he recognizes that this process, this full inhabiting of that state of being um, needs to ripen to its bursting point until it's ready to move on to something else. And I think that this ripening has happened on a collective level and that um, many of us are, are really done with it, no longer need to be there. It is a couple hundred years old. My favorite formulation of it was Bertrand Russell. You know, and he, this is hundred some years ago that he said that, um, basically he said, you know, we cannot deny, we cannot reasonably deny that the universe is nothing but a collocation of atoms bouncing around according to mathematical forces. We can't deny that. And so he said, any philosophy, any authentic, honest philosophy, any, it must be built on a firm foundation of unyielding despair. That's what he said. Only that will be a sound foundation for, for constructing a habitation for the human soul. Pretty bleak. But he was like Lauren, he was like, I'm not gonna accept any uh, comforting delusionary substitutes for the truth. And that was, I mean, this was before, before the 
scientific underpinnings of that worldview began to crumble. It was before quantum mechanics, before chaos theory. Um, and yeah, those are the two main pillars um, of the uh, religion, the metaphysics of science that are in fact no longer scientifically current. So yeah, we're, we're, we're still working through the legacy trauma of that worldview. And um, I think it echoes with other experiences of alienation and despair that our culture visits upon us. Um, it's the distillation of all of those. So yeah, I mean, I could, you know, like, so I can offer this alternative scenario of an unfolding of life and, and a universe coming alive and us being part of that coming alive and, and even us being a holographic map of this unfolding. Um, and it may offer a little comfort if it doesn't touch the core wound that uh, magnetizes the story of the dead mechanical universe to it. And I would also say that alongside the fear that that's true, there's also a, uh, like, you never fully succumb to it. There's always a intimation of a larger world story, a larger reality. What I'm offering here is a, real, a, a world story that includes the story of separation that, that, that Lauren spoke of, the, the entropy, the heat death of the universe, the meaninglessness, all that. Um, it includes that inside of a larger story. It says, yeah, that is a phase of human development, a phase of civilization, a phase of consciousness, and a necessary phase, but just a phase. So um, I'm offering an inclusion of that into a larger story. But that will be of scant solace if that phase has not fully reached its maturity. So, but I, but I will point then also like what carries us through that phase is the intimation of a larger reality, um, a, a spark of knowledge that that isn't all there is to it. And that can stay alive even when the mind completely rejects it, when the mind fully accepts the uh, uh, biomechanical machine in a dead soulless universe story. And you can feel the presence of that inside of you alongside the fear. Um, yeah, that's, I guess that's what I would say initially. Um, you know, one reason I'm hesitant to to go into metaphysics. I mean, one for one thing, I don't want to over overrepresent my knowledge. Uh, what I've said fits, it's logically coherent to me. And so it has an aesthetic appeal, but I don't know it. Uh, I tend to be oriented toward beauty. And if something is elegant and beautiful and coherent, I, uh, want to try it out. But that that fear lives in me too, the fear of, come on, Charles, you know that this is just a delusion and that in the end, you're just uh, yourself, a collocation of atoms with the illusion of consciousness, <clears throat> denying that until you get snuffed out too. And I guess my, <clears throat> my, my practice is to recognize that as a state of being and a story. And 
to be willing and, and, and open to to experiences that prove that wrong. It is a bit of a familiar abode. And be careful what you wish for. Because what does it call you into if you are here indeed to serve life, to be life? What ways have you habituated to the story that we grew up in? So there's a lot, a lot here. Um, you gotta, you know, in order to maintain the story of separation, you gotta dismiss a lot of stuff. Your sense of humor, you gotta dismiss that as some kind of, uh, you know, cynically putting a cheerful cover on something. But you can't say that that humor comes from a deep knowing that this is all some kind of game. Um, like you have to rewrite a lot of things. You have to interpret a lot of things to fit that narrative. And at some point you start asking, well, why am I so intent on conforming everything to this narrative? Why am I so intent on writing off every spiritual experience that, that I have, or if I don't, maybe I don't have any, but that people are telling me about left and right. Oh, they must just be deluding themselves. Like this is a kind of separation too to reject the reports of other people, to write off people who are not living in that story as being you know, subject to some kind of delusion, because I know better than them. That, I would be suspicious of that. Do you really know better than them? Do you know that you know? Why are you so sure? All right, yeah, I hope that was helpful, Lauren. Yeah, do you want to go into more detail or? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, I might have missed, missed some things. Yeah, if you want to move the chair over near the camera too, that might be helpful. They don't want me to because then you might look at me. Oh, You're supposed to look all at right. The camera. You could sit right behind the camera? Yeah, you can sit right behind it. That works for you guys? Like sure, even closer than last night. Yeah, right behind it. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. I'll say one more thing about this question. Why am I here? Or what's the point? Uh, not everybody needs to ask that question. What's important is not to ask that question. What's important is not to deny that question when it comes up and wants you to ask it. Once it comes up, once you've reached that, that phase where it's coming up and depending on your circumstances, your lineage, your, your psychic constitution. It could come up at age five or six. It could come up at adolescence, very commonly. Could come up uh, in middle age. Could come up on it, through the dying process. But when it does come up, it can be denied only at great cost to your soul. So you don't need to rush into that question. As Lauren was saying, maybe 90% of the people are not that interested in such metaphysical questions. But if it's up for you, then it's important to, to uh, accept that question, to, to let it in and to let it work you. That's what it really does is it works you. It, it won't let you go. And, and you can pretend, I mean, you can, and this is what, what Lauren was wary of, you know, to, to somehow quell it, to offer it a, a booby prize, a compensation, um, you know, a, a, a sop to make it go away, to deny it. You can only deny it once it's up for you. You can only de deny it by walling off part of yourself and living partially. So once it's up, like, yeah, I really do invite you to, um, to let it in. Hi everybody, Charles here again, half a year after the initial recording, hopefully half a year wiser as well. So in this second stage of the course production, I looked at session one 
And I was like, wow, this is really abstract. I'm speaking really slow. It's super heady. This isn't good enough. And I said, maybe we should even re-record it, you know, take it out. And Warren was like, but this is my favorite part. So I, so thinking about that, I, I decided, yeah, there's a lot of great material there. And it would really benefit by being made more concrete um, and more applicable to life to give you something to talk about also. So I want to address maybe three or four of the topics that I touched on in the first session. The first of them, this it kind of came across as an answer to the question, why am I here or what is the purpose of life? The idea that the purpose of life is to create more life, or in other words, the purpose of life is life. And I described this movement of the universe toward being more and more alive. I don't mean this as the answer. I mean it as an alternative to the story of the world that Lauren was talking about that I grew up in that explicitly or not said the purpose of life, it's either nothing, there is no purpose. Purpose is just our projection onto the world. It's our imagination. It's our desperate attempt to make meaning where there is no meaning. Or it said the purpose of life is to maximize reproductive self-interest encoded by our genes. And what I'm saying is that is a story. Another story is that the purpose of life is to be alive, to become more and more alive. And the purpose of a life, your life, is to contribute to this unfolding of aliveness in the universe. The same as is true of any living being in an ecosystem. They don't just survive and reproduce, but they contribute to the livingness of something bigger than themselves. So the human being is rather, rather new on this planet, and so our particular contribution to the unfolding of life is different than other organisms on this planet or to the unfolding of complexity. Uh, so I'm not, not restricting life simply to what we call biological organisms. And I'm not saying that who you are, I mean, we're talking about why you're here. Another question is, who are you? And that is a completely, well, it's a related topic, but it's another topic that maybe we'll touch on later. I mean, really, only two answers make sense, ultimately, to who are you? Nothing or everything. But We'll visit that another time. Right now, we're talking about why are you here? So, so to contribute to life, not just biological life, as I was saying, but also um, to something like the organism of a society, the organism of a civilization, or what the planet is becoming when you add the levels of human interaction and complexity onto the biological levels. And this does not, so I'm not saying, okay, all you are is this biological organism, what we define as life, what you learned life is in science class. Later in the course, we talk about questions like, you know, is a rock conscious? So we're really expanding what we mean by life here. So I'm not saying that all you are is just what um, science class told you reducible to protons, neutrons, and electrons, to 92 elements, to biochemistry, to uh, electrical impulses in the meat machine of your brain. I'm not saying that. The unfolding of complexity extends to realms that are pretty much off the map in terms of conventional science, in terms of what we know how to measure today. So they might include subtle energies uh, or patterns of patterns, meta-patterns, that have an aliveness that is not completely independent of the substrate on which they operate, but that are a separate or an additional living thing. So I'm, I'm not trying to reduce, provide a reductionist answer here. So anything else about that? Yeah, I'll say that what a contribution to life is for a person depends on the context that, that you're in, that the context that we are in in this time is rapidly changing. I speak a lot about the story that we live in. 
the story of separation, the discrete and separate self in a universe of other. And, and that story actually was a driver of what I call the ascent of humanity, the unfolding of complex societies, division of labor, specialization, technology, all the things that we associate good and bad with civilization were in some sense uh, driven by or co-evolved with the, uh, the, with the idea of separation and with the identity of separation. So that served the unfolding of life for a while, but today it does not. Today that story serves death on this planet, the reduction of complexity, the killing of ecosystems, um, the conversion of forests into tree plantations, the fishing out of the oceans. That story is no longer a in service to the unfolding of life. And so when our life energy, and this kind of goes to, to it helps me at least understand my resistance, my lifelong resistance to full participation in the program that I was offered, my life, my, my deep innate um, impulse and intuition about here's what I'm here for and here's what I'm not, and this doesn't feel right. It comes down to <clears throat> what, what I've been offered not really being in service to life. So this might be a practical, it might be even an orienting question that you could use in informing your choices. Is this in service to life? And if something is repellent to you, is that because it's not serving life? And I'm not all, I'm also not saying that this choice is always obviously altruistic. Serving your own healing might be a really important step right now in this phase of your development in serving life, serving your psychological healing, your physical healing, uh, your recovery from trauma. Uh, that th There might be a phase of that that looks very inward, but that actually is preparing you to move beyond the patterning and the roles that correspond to that wounded state of being. So, yeah, please allow the service to life, uh, this, this concept of I am life. Therefore, I, like all life, am here to make the whole world more alive. Let that Try that on and let that color your perceptions for a while and, and see how that idea works on you. Okay, the second thing. It's related. Um, it's the, the idea that this story, this whole metaphysics that we were born into that is embedded in science that I grew up in, that Lauren is speaking about, uh, that her father told her about uh, when he tried to answer her deep questions. Well, you know, he, his go-to was, here's what science says, that this isn't just an intellectual edifice, but it is also a state of being. And you can feel, you can actually, here's a way, we'll do a little experiment here to um, notice the state of being that co-resonates with that ideology of uh, a dead material universe, a biochemical accident that's you. Like, what is the state of being? How does it feel to inhabit that story today? Uh, and it once maybe felt different. It once might have been a very liberating story from rigid religious orthodoxy. Science, this, these ideas were once like astonishing. They were liberatory. Uh, but today they, they feel very different. So imagine that you have uh, a mind-blowing mystical experience and you're you have I hear stories like this sometimes like in this intense telepathic relationship with somebody and everything they're thinking you're thinking it too and and then you you confirm it by saying were you just thinking of that and they're like yeah and and it's just this incredible thing wow what does that open up to you and then I explain it away and I say actually all that was was um, a lot of subtle cueing uh, and uh, self-delusion. And because you so wanted to believe it afterwards, you kind of filled in the gaps and made it up. But it was actually all just some brain chemistry. That's all. Or your experience of communion with God. Oh, yeah, there's a center in your brain that is responsible for 
uh, orienting you in external reality and defining your boundaries. And when that malfunctions, you have a sense of universal oneness. That's all that happened. So there's when I reduce your, I mean, the, the word reduce is very natural here. When I reduce your uh, mystical experience to just, it's just, I mean, that's also a natural word to use here, just um, an accident of brain chemistry. Don't you feel a kind of a deflation? And that leads me to a third thing here of what are we afraid of? And what is the comfort of staying in the world and the identity that goes along with it and that whole state of being? What's the comfort in staying there? And what becomes possible when we step out of that? What courage is allowed when you no longer believe that you are a discrete, separate meat machine whose consciousness gets snuffed out like a candle flame on the moment of death, um, leaving no trace? Like, what happens when you let go of that? For me, it's almost scary. What happens when I truly believe and I really occupy the place of I am a holographic map of everything in the universe or everything on this planet, and that what I do to the world somehow comes back to me in some way, in some form, not necessarily as a direct consequence, but but anything I put out there, any violence I cause, maybe it doesn't mean that someone's going to be violent to me, but maybe any violence I do externally corresponds to an inner violence that shuts down, kills some part of myself, and my experience of life becomes that much less uh, alive. Like that kind of logic, what happens if I, if I really accept that? and have the faith and trust in that? Who do I become then? So these are questions that I'd like you to explore as I, as I raise these topics. Okay, so I'll add one more thing to all of this. Uh, even though I thought, ah, oh, it's just like too much sciencey stuff for one session, but um, Lauren, again, encouraged me to go with it. So the, this question is, well, okay, what does it look like for the universe to become more and more alive? And, and maybe one way to see it is to take the initial transition from a unicellular life to multicellular life. Like the cells are just as alive, maybe no more, no less than they ever were, but there's a new aliveness that comes through their, their, um, their coming together. Uh, and then the another level of aliveness is the interactions of of the whole community of uh, unicellular and multicellular organisms into an ecosystem and and so to understand that the ecosystem is alive too i mean this was this is actually really new for science to even recognize that ecosystems that forests that soil these are alive these are living beings not just conglomerates of living beings, but they in themselves are alive. And then we can take it to even the, another level of the uh, of human culture, which has all of these, the same kinds of feedback mechanisms and nonlinear relationships that a living being does. Uh, incredible complexity, the way that an economy works, the way that a society works. So that's a new level of aliveness that humans have brought to the world. And you could debate whether is that really different and how is it different from the aliveness of soil. But still, it's another, uh, another unfolding of complexity, of livingness. And so here we are. Many people think that we're kind of at a critical juncture in the um, coming of age, of the transition of of humanity to a true organism rather than kind of a bunch of competing cells that are kind of still learning how to work together. This might be the transition that's in front of us to really become an organism. You know, in your body, your cells are not selfish. None of them sequester sugar just in case. You know, they, they, get, they have like a three-second supply. They're getting supplied all the time with glucose. They, they, and they are, in turn, they completely are in service to the rest of the body. 
They are not in scarcity. Humans, in relationship to each other in this meta-organism called a civilization or a society, we haven't quite gotten to that yet. Maybe, actually, you could say that indigenous people, hunter-gatherers, traditional people um, did uh, do that, but that was on a much smaller scale. On a, a, on a vast scale of, of billions of people, that has not happened yet. So perhaps our service to life, or part of it, or for many of us, it could be serving the coherence of all of humanity into a meta-organism that is as well-functioning uh, and as, as a biological organism, multicellular organism is. So that's the kind of speculation I would, I would take that in. And then what's after that? It is endless, level after level after level.